What's going on guys? It's Brian and Jack with Simple Man's Comics where we are helping to amplify your comic book collection through Integrity and Community. We do a lot of comic and pop culture content on this channel. So if you're new here, consider subscribing. Here we are, Thursday night, Bolo Show. That's right, we're talking about comic book releases from this current week that just came out yesterday. We're talking about first appearances, we're talking about reader buzz, we're talking about variant buzz, and a great long-term play. How was your new comic book day, Jack? Brian, I got to tell you, man, I, I'm loving today. I, I mean, I love every new comic book day, right? But today is kind of special. There's a huge list of books that I think are garnering a lot of attention, but they're garnering a lot of attention for the right reasons, Brian. We're talking reader buzz, some serious reader buzz action going on today. A lot of books with a lot of exciting things happening that I can't wait to get into. Right, real quick, couple announcements. This show is brought to you from SlabbedHeroes.com. Check out SlabbedHeroes.com and get those guaranteed modern 9.8s, but they also have Raws and some store exclusive on there as well. SlabbedHeroes.com, check them out. Great packaging, great comics. Also, if you want to help support the channel and get something in return, Patreon.com forward slash Simple Man's Comics. We have multiple tiers up there from as low as a dollar all the way up to that premium tier that gets you that premium mystery bolo box where we're throwing those Frankie's Comics exclusives in there. Another great channel sponsor. And we're going to be having some Slabbed Heroes books come in there as well. Yeah. Raw books. We're talking raw. Might be a great book every now and then. Who knows? But the inventory for those bolo boxes is starting to mount up. And we can't be more excited for it. Right, Jack? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. is we want, We've made no secret of it that we want to beat every mystery box out there on the market in quality for the price. And we have teamed up with some great partners to get some exclusive books. And we're not talking about one exclusive book. We're talking about a host of exclusive books. So we hope to be able to bring you at least two exclusives every single month. And as this program grows, we can do more and more. So you mentioned Slab Heroes. We mentioned um, Frankie's Comics. We're working with a couple other people that I can't yet say. Um, but we are right about to make a couple more announcements on the channel and bring you guys more heat for these Bolo boxes as well as that exclusive December box where you've got till the end of the month this month to get that uh, order in. And we've got that Carnage t-shirt, exclusive, um, amazing t-shirt, Simple Mint's comic swag. And that is going to, you know, in your size, completely customizable, but will only be available for those who take part in the Bolo Box program and will never be sold again. Right, and it's important if you're interested in that Carnage shirt, cutoff for that is next Friday, November 29th. That's when we're getting the sizes turned in so the shirts can start to be produced in time for December's Bolo Box. We also have the alternative if you don't want the shirt, a lot of Patreons, if they decide to have just the regular premium Bolo Box instead, that is an option as well. But we mentioned Integrity and Community, that's why we're talking about these books, these sponsorship deals that we have in place. All that books goes into those Bolo boxes, and we pay them out to the insider community through Patreon. So we practice what we preach. Community is where it's at, and that's our way of paying it forward to the Patreon members that help support the channel. Absolutely. And with that being said, we're going to bring the Bolo list up on the screen right now. Big list this week. I think Jack used that four font to get all those books on there. But Jack, holy crap. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, you know, I really blame is the first appearance section. Um, usually some weeks I'm like scrambling for an appearance or two to fill out that section. Not this week. Uh, the comics industry came hard. And to be honest with you, there's probably a couple that were like late breaking that didn't even make it to the list by print time. So um, action packed week this week for first appearances. Right, and as we always say, if you aren't familiar what BOLO stands for, it is be on the lookout. We always say this list is comprised of the comic book community across all the social media. We also want to make sure that you know that we just put list on there. Just as the title says, we have first appearances. Then we have books that have buzz around them. These aren't books that we're saying, hey, these are books that are going to make you rich. These are books that people are talking about. That's why we make this list every week. And then we come and discuss them on this show to amplify your comic book collection. We're going to get right into it with the first appearances for the week. Starting with Captain Marvel number 12. Now this was built up way before FOC. People were talking about this probably about two issues ago. But what do you got to say about this, Jack? 
Yeah, this was the, probably the big book of the day, right? So we have been kind of anticipating this whole dark Captain Marvel situation. Now, again, there's some people are going to argue Eleven was a first appearance. I think it, you know, it was cameo at best, probably um, wasn't a strong appearance. And that's even coming from me. And you guys know how I feel about the cameo first full appearance argument. Um, I definitely think issue 12 is the one to get if you're um, looking to add dark Captain Marvel to your collection. But I mentioned, Brian, this is my kind of like Marvel monthly pull book, right? I'm really excited to get in and read this one uh, ever since issue eight, which I, I mean, and again, if you guys have been following us, if you guys have been watching on the channel, Brian talks about integrity, full transparency. We bagged issue eight, right? We talked about how we didn't see any potential in it. Brian's still not on board. But I started reading the issues. I tend to follow the secondary market. So when you guys on the secondary market are buying something, I'll, I'll pay attention to it. And I kind of gotten hooked into this story. Also, I admit, Hugh Mark Brooks fan, a uh, big fan of his art. By the way, shout out to Mark Brooks. He liked the bolo list today on Instagram. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if he's doing a cover, I'll tend to pay attention. And this was probably the release of the week. This was the one that was the most anticipated by probably collectors and secondary market speculator flipper those types um and i think it's kind of underwhelmed and i think it's underwhelmed because of probably the print run and the fact that this was a book we saw in the solicit right they talked about death of an avenger um so yes spoiler alert there was a death in this book and we're gonna, i'm going to talk about it but it, it was it was well known these variant covers gorgeous um, the one in 25 variant, which is in the bottom middle is, is amazing. The in um, bottom left connecting cover. I think that connecting set is going to be one to have the Mark Brooks Virgin. Um, I think that was like one on 100. Um, I think that's, you know, obviously that art is amazing. I'm not, you know, Miga though, again, if you guys are watching the channel, I'm not a big fan of like Virgin versions of books that come with a trade dress. The only cover that I don't really necessarily like is the 2099 variant, but you know, you can't win them all. And there's several store exclusives that are gorgeous for this book. And I can't fault any store who went out and produced an exclusive for this book. But now we're going to talk about the spoiler section. And, and since reading is important to us, we want to let everybody know that before we talk about it. So, you know, if you need to mute it for a second, there is a death of an Avenger. And in this book, this the death of Thor. Now, it looks like Supreme Vox, um, who we don't know yet. I've ha I had a conversation with a couple people today. Is this the same Vox from Death of Inhumans, maybe with a different title and a different costume, or is it a different character? There are some people in the community calling it a first appearance, some people not. You know the truth is? No one knows. It's just guessing. Usually if a, a character calls themselves something different and wears a different costume, the secondary market will deem it a first appearance. They will count it as a different character, but the only time is going to tell on that, right? That's not what, what to get tripped up with here. The key is Vox is here, um, and it looks like he has commanded Dark Captain Marvel to kill all the Avengers. So it looks like that's where the storyline's going to go. It looks like she's going to got a hit list, and she's going to go one by one and kill the Avengers. She kills Thor, decapitates him, holds his head up. Um, this is very Walking Dead-esque. Um, it reminds me a lot of The Whisperers. But obviously this isn't something that's going to stick, right? We've got a new Donny Cates Thor book coming this is the one-eyed Thor, short hair Thor. This is like not even the same version that we're seeing in Donny Cates' run. Um, it's, so I don't think this is something to long-term pay attention to. And I had this discussion with um, actually Nick from Slabbed Heroes where I said, you know, this, this will get a lot of attention today. But I don't think that this is like a long-term book per se because I don't know that Dark Captain Marvel is per se going to stay. And I don't know that... Um, the death of Thor, it's, I know that's not like a permanent death. So, you know, great read, shocking, fun, exciting. Did its job. I'm amped up for the next issue to see which Avengers decks. But secondary market-wise, I don't think it's the book everybody thought it was going to be. But that's just my opinion. Let us know in the comment section how you feel about this. Well, hot dang, Jack. You done sold me on it. <laughs> I'm still going to wait for the trade. I know you are. <laughs> Like, I have no doubt, like, none of my uh, holding off on this has anything to do with the actual book. It just comes to a comic book budget, comes to the amount of titles that I'm buying out there right now. Um, 
yeah, I fully admit when we were talking about Step 8, I was like, oh, that's Captain Marvel. But there's enough buzz around it that, yes, when it comes out in a trade or however, I will probably pick it up and give it a read. But we're going to move into the next one on the first appearances, and we're talking about Teen Titans number 36. Now, if you watched our three up, three down, we talked about how Crush is kind of on the downward trend right now, but here we have front and center right on the cover. There's some buzz about this book, and then we also have First appearance of what? The Other? The Other. Very cool looking character. Last page, splash page. Will definitely be deemed by secondary market folks as a cameo, I would imagine. Just based on history. Either way. Cool looking character we know absolutely nothing about. So, um, I think people are excited. But, you know, how many uh, how many false flag Teen Titans first appearances have we seen before where like you get hyped for a character in this series? It doesn't turn out to be anything. But that's just my opinion, so I'm more of a wait-and-see guy. Um, you mentioned Crush being front and center on these Year of the Villain books. They actually changed the trade dress, as you can see, to the main villain from the series. And if you haven't been reading the series, you may be like, well, wait a minute. I thought Crush was a member of the Teen Titans. Heel turn. That was the big event that's been going on, teaming up with her father, um, hence Cover B. It's been a cool story. It's been a fun read. If you're not reading it, you should easily be able to find the back issues cheap. If that's not the route you want to go, be on the lookout for those trades when they come out. Um, and be on the lookout for returning to Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. The weekly picks, except with a different spin. Right, Brian? Yeah, definitely. We got our weekly picks coming back. And it's going to have a spin on it, so it's not what you think. But stay tuned. We're going to have some good content coming about that. And like we said, we're talking about comic book reading is what the emphasis is going to be on for this weekly picks. So that's what we're going to be going with. New content. And it will be up very soon on a weekly basis. Which is weekly picks. Having said that. We are going to move right on into the next first appearance. And we're talking about Supergirl number 36. This is right. Supergirl Who Laughs. Yeah, Supergirl the Infected, as it says yeah. on the uh, main cover. But so it's, this, it's still like Oprah. <laughs> handing out who laughs characters and everything right now we've got our secret six our new secret six the infected secret six um is not so secret anymore um and she is obviously the villain front and center on this book i heard this compared to uh black suit spider-man and before everybody freaks out and goes what what i mean by that is she appears in this book first and another book this week so there's technically two first appearances Oh, uh, we got Teen Titans number 12 all over. Right, so there's two, there's two first appearances this week of her. Um, so you could kind of go either book. That'll probably cancel it out. But to be honest with you, I don't think this is a long-term thing, obviously. Um, great. It's been a great story, a fun read. It's actually caught me off guard how good the, like, the Batman Superman series, where she also appears in, has been. Um, that was a series I thought was going to be a throwaway series, like the movie. But... Uh, um, you know, Supergirl the Infected, part of that Secret Six. Um, if you haven't checked it out, that's another one. You know, maybe you it's it's crosses over with so many books. Well, there that's we go. Why, we'll just bring it up. Batman Superman yeah, number four. Go. Four. And and this is one where if you haven't, say, been following this whole storyline, the that my best suggestion to you would be because it crosses over with so many different series, would wait for like that hardcover that I imagine will encompass all of these infected stories but batman superman has been a fun series issue they're only on issue four they're they're gettable um we've talked about them in the first appearances i think every issue brandon because whether it was shazam or um blue beetle or some other character superman we've been talking about in these infected characters and you know I think having Batman who laughs as the main villain in this series was genius. I think it's helped sell a series that doesn't usually do too strongly. Um, the acetate covers are, that they've been doing are awesome. Um, yes. You know, those are absolute, you know, it's funny. People look at those as gimmicky, I think at first, but then when they became in hand, people realized, man, these things are gorgeous. Um, and most gimmicks, they, they work the first time. The first time you do them, they work. If watch Marvel go, and run out 400 acetate covers and we'll all get tired of them. 
They're going to make the whole book acetate, so then it's going to be like Captain Underpants Fliparama. Right. <laughs> we were just talking about Captain Underpants before uh, the show started. <laughs> but, yeah, both of our kids are Captain Underpants and Dogman fans. Yes. But, but uh, graphic novels, man, they're reading them. Yeah, and that's what, that's what I said. I said, you know, I don't mind spending the money on that for my kids because it's awesome seeing my kids reading graphic novels, and I hope that that starts the trend of them becoming comic book fans the way that we are. So that's always the hope. As long as, you know, when you talk about kids, as long as they're reading. Yeah. And um, so we're going to move into the next one. The next first appearance was Nightwing number 66, right? Right. I love this series and I love this storyline. And it's this one I love because I love Talon as a character. He's my favorite. When everyone talks about the Court of Owls, right? Everybody talks about um, different aspects of like Scott Snyder's Batman run. No one ever brings up Talon. And I think Talon is my favorite because the kind of the relationship he has to Damien, the relationship he has to Dick Grayson. I think is really interesting because he sees a lot of himself in them, but then there's the jealousy aspect involved. Um, you know, that life hasn't kind of gone the, that way for him here. We see Dick Grayson, um, who's been going by, uh, Richard Grayson, um, takes over as talent. He was officially brought into the court of owls with the last issue. And he takes over as the next talent and he goes by the name gray son. So now if you thought that, Dick Grayson was murdersome before. I have a feeling he's going to get very murderous now. Um, I'm interested to see where this goes. I hope it's a kind of a no permanent thing because obviously Nightwing is an important character, but this has a, a Red Hood feel to it to me. So I hope that we get this for at least a good period of time. Um, and to be honest with you, on the big scale of things, like Nightwing had his run too. Like I also look at it like it was a popular character for a long time. His first appearance hasn't really spiked anything huge. He's gotten kind of all the traction he's gotten. I think he's most known for the fact that women find him attractive. Um, so I think this could be a cool use of Dick Grayson. But I also was on board for, like, Secret Agent Spy Grayson. Um, and that didn't stick, and the community didn't really love that. But if you're not reading this series, this is another one I advocate reading. I enjoy reading this on a monthly basis. So one thing I want to bring up about those acetate covers, talk about how gorgeous they are. Um, I can see these covers, especially a couple years down the road when people are looking for them. It's hard to tell the title of the actual book because of the yeah. year of the villain and talent in the court of the house. Um, you're going to see people searching for those instead of like Nightwing 66. And they've done that kind of across the board with this year of the villain covers. Love the acetate covers. It's just something I could see down the road trying to put into a search engine to find it people might have some issues with but the next one on the first appearance is we got that new deadpool and we got a bunch of covers for it i'm sorry i just can't get excited for another deadpool series what are we on volume 76 yeah it's like volume seven or eight um <laughs> now if you i didn't I, full disclosure i didn't read this book there's a new villain king of monsters maybe it's cool um if you read it and I'm just way off base, let me know. I'm probably still going to make you prove it to me for the next couple months before I jump on. Um, it's going to be the next Captain Marvel. You're going to have to prove it to me. And look, I don't mind being wrong, right? You and I, you and I, we say this is sports talk radio for comics. We're up here giving our opinion. Um, doesn't mean like I am the end all be all authority on everything that's fucking cool. <laughs> everything, you know, it is what it is. Um, Gig for being. But, <laughs> but it's one of those things like this this book I, I love Deadpool I'm wearing a Deadpool hat actually right now ironically um, but this series doesn't appeal to me at all because number one they have built no it, Deadpool and Harley Quinn to me are the same thing they've built no continuity with the character yep. they've had no consistency with the character and I feel some sort of way you guys know, if you, again, if you watch the channel, if you're new, let me school you on something. I love Rob Liefeld. I don't care. I'm unapologetically a Rob Liefeld guy. I know he can be a jerk, but I grew up with him. So I look at it like, that's my guy. Rob Liefeld created this mercenary character who happened to also be funny. And it's been turned into a comedy character who happens to also be a mercenary. And 
I want to get back to those old school Deadpool stories. Um, I don't want writers to try to make Ryan Reynolds on the page. And that's what seems to be happening. So until somebody tells me this is a killer story that you need to read, um, I'll pass. My favorite cover, uh, just from Nostalgia Stake, is uh, the Kevin Eastman store variant that Clover Press, um, who's actually a small press book publisher, did. Because I just think it's cool Kevin Eastman did a, a uh, Deadpool cover. But, you know, other than that, there's a million covers, there's a million store variants, and I have no interest in any of them. But if you did read it and you enjoyed it, let us know in the comments and see if we can sway Jack's opinion. I guess mine too. I didn't pick it up. I had no intention of buying it. Buy what you like. I like Deadpool, but like he said, this just it's gone through the laundry machine too many times. It's faded. It's shrunk. Right. <laughs> and, you, and you mentioned budgets, right? We're all on a budget. Like, yep. look at this list. Yep. People, I think there's a misconception sometimes that you, but especially me, that we're out here buying every book on the list, which is not the case, or that we're out here speculating on every book and buying stacks of copies, which is certainly not the case. Yep. And the reality is this book is on the list because it's got a first appearance and people are talking about it. And if it wasn't on the first appearance list, it probably would have been on the reader buzz list. Um, it could have possibly had variants on the variant buzz list. But the reality is it, none of that would have swayed me into buying it. I need you guys, my trusted Simpleman's Comics family, to tell me I'm missing out for me to check it out. Definitely. And carrying on in the extensive first appearance section of the Bolo List this week, <laughs> we have Fantastic Four 2099 number one. Yeah, and I'll be brief because this is another one where it's like I don't have a whole lot of interest in this huge 2099 crossover thing. Um, it'll be temporary. It's a marketing thing. So look, 2099 is cool. I grew up in the era of the 2099 stuff. Um, but the original 2099 teams and books aren't worth anything outside of Spider-Man. So why would a new Fantastic Four 2099 team be worth anything? Why would this be? Because, again, and you guys who, again, will watch the show know how I feel about team appearances. This is a team first appearance of Fantastic Four 2099. This is a gimmick. And I don't blame Marvel for doing it. Um with the popularity of Spider-Man 2099 coming back into focus with the Spider-Verse movie. But, I, you know, uh, this is an easy pass for me. I do want to give a shout out to YouTube land and ask the question, legend, if you're reading this book, let us know DMs, comment, whatever. Is it worth reading? Cause I didn't pick it up, but if you say the story's good, I'll give I'll check it out. That's for anyone that's watching. Um, I'm of the same frame of mind. Not a big fan of 2099. I'm I'm living in the 2019, <laughs> but I wasn't a fan of 2099 much in the 90s either. But either way, put it on there. First appearance, new team. Moving on, and we're getting into King Thor number three. One of my favorite titles right now. Like I always say, I'm sad to see Jason Aaron in his run, but equally excited to see Donny Cates pick up the mantle. Here we have first appearance of the first full appearance of Sky Lords, right? Yeah, so the Sky Lords previously appeared in their human form in Thor God of Thunder number one. This is them kind of in their final form here. Um, and yeah, with with Jason Aaron wrapping up his run, it's kind of hard to tell whether or not this is gonna be a character that's maybe set up for the Downey Cates run. Um, we really don't know yet what Downey Cates has in store for this character, for this for this series um but the other cool thing about this book and kind of my initial main attraction to it before finding anything out about a first appearance is this whole thor versus gore the god butcher thing um gore the god butcher has kind of commanded the attention of readers collectors everybody and front and center you see it on the cover and that's always going to make me grab it from an lcs shelf right and the good thing also is what there's just the one cover for it this time Right, yeah, just one cover. Um, I'm more excited for that variant cover for the next issue, which has Jason Aaron on the cover. It's um, a Del Mundo cover, right? Right, right. Big tribute to Jason Aaron's run, all the characters that he's used in the series. Real cool cover. Yeah, and even though it's regular priced, I still reserved it at my LCS today just because I'm that, was that, that excited for it. 
Yeah, yeah, and if you're a huge if you're a huge Thor fan, that's a book. Hit uh, Nick from Slab Heroes up. He can probably do that guaranteed nine eight for you, and that'd be one to have. All right. So that's going to wrap up our first appearance section for us. Before we get into that reader buzz, do us a favor, click that thumbs up button for us. Let us know in the comments, did you pick any of these books up as well? And with that being said, we're going to roll right into the reader buzz section this week. Starting with one of the favorites on this channel. We've talked about this book plenty of times. We're going to talk about Canto number six. So this was the end to this current chapter with our favorite character, Canto. I have this in my pool list. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Super excited too, so I'm definitely going to be reading it by the time this video premieres. Yeah, me too. Actually, to be honest with you, with some of the releases that were coming out today that I felt like I, like, I got to read this before I get on the mic and talk, I actually haven't read this one yet, but this is probably my favorite book that came out today. I've enjoyed this series. You guys know if you've watched how much Brian and I love this book, um, how we have an affinity for this character, um, the little tin man with a heart. And um, this series has been great. I'm really excited that we're going to get more Canto. Because I, I, going into this, I thought, like, this is it. I thought when it came to issue six, I'd be kind of bummed out. But uh, I'm more hopeful for what's to come. I want to say shout out to Drew Zucker and David Boer. But these were two guys who created this character, put their heart and soul into it. And it's been fun to see, like, the success that they've had with this character and um, the way that you guys have received it. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk early on about initial sellouts and things like that. And then as that passed, what has not gone away is the reader buzz on a consistent and monthly basis for the series. And here's the thing. Here's the great thing about um, when you have kind of that like drop off from that initial issue number one release, you can go to IDW's website right now. And pick up cub issues one through six, first print. You can also pick up the second prints and the third prints for issues one through three for cover price. So if you were late on this one, if you don't, you're not a trade guy. You, if you want to, uh, you know, put that one through six set together. If you believe David Boer's hype on seven seasons in a movie, um, you know, uh, now you can do that, and you know, for twenty something bucks put this set together but also they're already solicited to trade paperback and that's coming soon as well so that's something to keep an eye out for this series has been great and i have no doubt it's going to end and finish up well i love that one in ten incentive cover yes i mean i can't say i loved how it ended because i haven't read number six yet but i, I will either. say if there's a hardcover deluxe edition i'm definitely picking up because this is one of those stories that i've enjoyed reading no matter what it kind of takes you back to your the movies, those animated movies you watch as a child. But either way, if you haven't read Canto and you're looking for a good fantasy story, I highly recommend this one. Yeah, this is one actually my kids have seen me read several times and have like, you know, noticing the art on the cover have asked me about, but I don't want to mess in my floppies up. So I told them and promised them like when the trade comes out, I'll buy you the trade. We'll sit down and read the trade together. So I'm looking forward to doing that. And that's what's so awesome about comics is that whole generational pass down appeal then the next one we're talking on the reader buzz is heartbeat this had that regular cover then there was the foc variant but then boom gave out a thank you variant which was what one per store right one per store and that book has generated a ton of buzz in the community um i saw so many posts out there from you guys um and we're talking from the major influencer types like nick from key collector all the way to like just everybody, you hit that uh, that heartbeat hashtag, you're seeing that one per store variant posted. Now, we've talked a lot about Boom Studios, probably the hottest publisher of 2019. I don't care. People are going to say, you know, you guys like Boom Studios. But it's just a fact. Like, they've put out, like, six independent book seven hits. But this is where we'll give you guys transparency. Brad and I aren't quite sold on this book yet, right? Uh, you know, read it. It was pretty good. Just seemed kind of good. depressing. Yeah. Didn't hit me the way um, some of the other books they've put out have, but it, I'm on board for issue two, and we'll see what happens. I'm more excited for the upcoming Red Mother book um, that's dropping this month, but you know, um, we'll see. We'll see. And I liked Folklords better last week, but 
This this is one that I think the variant art sold this book more than anything else. Yeah, I won't say I didn't like the book because I enjoyed the book for what it was. Um, but when you're used to something's killing the children, once in future, let's say folklords, it's got a much faster pace. My first issue on this one is kind of, kind of setting up the background, the storyline. Yeah. Um, you see this girl who's, what, the daughter of a, of a maid that helped get into this fancy school. And it's just kind of some... Uh, it, there's when I say it's depressing. There's some depressing things that go on in the in the story. It's yeah, it's just kind of uh, not off-putting. It just kind of sets the tone a little bit darker, or so. Or, so yeah, still a good issue. Enjoyed it. I got just the cover A. I didn't get the FOC or the or the thank you variant. Did enjoy the story, and I will definitely continue to pick it up. Yeah, yeah, without doubt. And that's the thing is a lot of times when they start slow like this. And they give you all of this information in issue one where it's like all those depressing things that you referenced. Um, you know, our main character has got to go somewhere from here. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. Right. But, you know, um, this is from the artist behind Faithless, too. That's another thing. Uh, yeah, it included a, pre a preview to Faithless, I think, in it, right? I believe. Yeah. So if you haven't read yeah. Faithless and kind of wonder about it, pick up Heartbeat and kind of get the sense of what Faithless is about as well. Just don't read it around your kids. No. <laughs> Either book. <laughs> but So the next book we're going to talk about is Heart Attack. And we actually do have quite a few things to say about this. New series came out from Image Skybound Imprint. But also this week, we interviewed the author, Sean Kittleson, right here on this channel. That video is available now. I'll put a link in the description of the video as well as a card up above if you want to click that and watch that interview. But Heart Attack... This is another one that's kind of one of those um, X-Men type feel books to it, right? Yeah, like I hate to compare because I think it sets any indie career up for like a difficult kind of – I don't want to – I don't want to set Sam uh, – uh, uh, or trust me. I don't want to set Sean up to kind of like have to fill Jonathan Hickman's shoes here. <laughs> um, but what I'm going to say is if you're looking for like the elevator pitch – it's X-Men, it's Runaways, it's Cloak and Dagger, um, it's it combined. The book advertises itself as X-Men and Runaways. I took more Cloak and Dagger from it because you have two characters who realize that they are further powered by touching each other. It's a love story between the two of them, um, but they come from different worlds, and that to me is very Cloak and Dagger. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of things we can say about this series. It's a it's it's an interesting first issue. It's an action-packed first issue. Um, it's a story that kind of has a message and um, looks like it's going to kind of go in some, like, interesting directions. But if you want to see, like, how, how we really think in depth, check out that Creator Spotlight video. It's 50 minutes with the, with the uh, writer. Um, we talk in depth about the first issue. We talk in depth about where the first arc is going. There's not more we can give you guys if you're on the fence about a book than that. So, like, I would love for you guys, if you're, like, if you saw Heart Attack today and you maybe thought about getting it and you were on the fence, um, to go ahead and, and watch that video and see how you feel. It's also important to note that um, Sean is the writer behind the video game Injustice 2 and Mortal Kombat X, as well as the Mortal Kombat X comic. Um, and... Mortal you know, Kombat like, 11 as well. Right, Mortal Kombat 11. And it's always important to note, Skybound does have that first look deal with Amazon. So this is, you know, one of those things. This could be a TV series at some point. So, you know, there's only one cover. There is a variant. It's only from One Stop Shop uh, Comics up in Massachusetts. I love their variant. Absolutely love their variant. It depicts kind of a scene that happens within the comic it's great. Um, and it's by the same auth the same artist from the book, Eric Zavatsky. And another cool thing is um, all of the profits from the print, and he said most likely digital as well, is going to the Southern Poverty Law Center to work on uh, criminal justice reform. And that's so for issues is all, 1 through 12, not just issue 1. Right. So this is a creator who is writing a story from you know a point of passion, and he's hoping to not just be able to tell a story, 
but do some good with that story. So, I mean, how can you not get on board with that? Um, so, you know, if you're on the fence about this one, check out that video um, and see if this story at all lands with something that you can relate to. And I think most people will find that it does. And the next book on the Reader Buzz we're going to talk about is Absolute Carnage number five. The finale. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed this book. I've seen a lot of negative talk about this book. And let's be honest, Brian, this is just people mad because they're not getting what they want out of Dylan. But I think you're missing the big picture. And I think when people step back from this, um, they will see that this story has been masterfully told. This is just people who are trying to profit from a book, um, being mad because whether it's the solicit, whether it's – Donnie knows what he's doing, man. So does Marvel. These guys are stringing this along very slowly, but each each issue – I almost said episode because that's how it feels. Each each issue has gives us a little bit more, a little bit more about this character. Um a little bit more into his powers, his, a little bit more insight. Um, and I think most of us expected this Dylan transformation to happen, right? Um, it most likely in Venom 20 or Ven even Venom 21. Um, it's probably never going to happen in the pages of Absolute Carnage. But, you know, I thought this book was great. I thought the series was great. Um, we talked about this. I think it's a modern masterpiece. It's a series that will hold up over time it is a must get hardcover with the the one through five plus all of the tie-ins um the variant art throughout this series was outstanding right i have this i haven't read this issue yet but i'm definitely excited to finish it up see the finale and then see where we go from here because we got venom island coming right around the corner yeah and i'm excited for that too i mean just I wasn't a huge – I mean, not like it wasn't a huge symbiote fan, but I I wasn't the way other people are, right? I'm not – some people are just diehard symbiote yeah. fans. Um, but, I, man, Donny Cates has me so invested in this series. So. Venom Island. Venom. Tribe is spoken. <laughs> <laughs> You've been voted off the island. Yeah. But moving on, we're going into Immortal Hulk number 27. Yeah, we get the showdown uh, with the Matador. Um, this this series, I haven't gotten to. I skimmed this book. I haven't gotten to read it yet. Um, by the way, I think that that variant cover is absolutely atrociously ugly. Um, <laughs> yes. yeah. Just my opinion. Yeah. Um, you know, to each his own. It's like but uh, hippo, hippo Hulk. Yeah, you see stuff like that, and I always hate when you watch things like um, there's uh. You know, a YouTube channel where there's a um, it's it takes place in an LCS and there's an LCS owner who is really well known and uh, he's just so negative on the art of every book and I always laugh because it's like man I'm not I I'm not an artist to the level that I could ever work for Marvel um, so I don't like to judge it that much but you look at that and go man you guys could not pick better artwork like than that but whatever that's to each his own. It, you know what makes it worse, Brian? You put it next to that Alex Ross cover. Yeah. That's, that's what makes it real tough because Alex Ross is killing these Immortal Hulk covers. But this, this, this week, this issue flew a bit under the radar. I think there were so many good reads. There was a lot people were picking up. I think everybody picked this book up. But I don't know that it was like on the top of many people's stacks. We'll have to see. But let us know in the comments section if I need to get off the mic right now and go run and read this book. Let me know. Yeah, another one we're going to talk about is a big reader buzz book, and that's Star Wars number 75. Yeah, so this is the final issue in this first volume back with Marvel um, from their initial run with Marvel going through the, the whole uh, Dark Horse era. Um, you know, marketing-wise, right, they want to reboot. Um, I think also they want to tell some different stories. Uh, you know, you've been doing the Skywalker story. It's kind of similar to what's going on with the movies, right? So the movies want to expand the universe. They want to tell different stories. Um, I'd be honest with you, I am so kind of played out with Vader and Luke and Leia, and I'm excited. I, I've never been much of a um, like Rebels cartoon guy. Um, I want to. I want. I want more of that. I love what the Mandalorian is doing right now. So, or even just the new mythos with the the, the newer the move the newer. The, the newer characters they've created. Yeah, Ray and Finn and 
I mean, they yep. had Poe Dameron, they had those other, but explore deeper into that side of it would be cool. Right. Go, go before the movies, Force Awakens and so on, and go after, for sure. That's why I'd rather see that. Um, I'd rather see them go into some of the characters they organically created within the series. Um, there's several, several first appearances that you have, you know, of characters that were created within the pages of this run, within the pages of the Darth Vader run, within the pages of the Poe Dameron run, that I think I'd rather see them explore more of that. You know, and and comics when they work at their best, they essentially can be storyboard for movies. And I think that this this can be something that gives the folks making the movies that's for Star Wars, you know, a lot of like real hardcore evidence of what works and what doesn't. Um, so I would like to see that. Uh, it's always difficult though, when you're dealing with a property like star Wars, right? Because you don't know what they have the permission to do or what they don't have the permission to do. But ex- I'd expect star Wars one to be a huge issue. There's when that reboot of star Wars comes. Oh yeah. 32 nine, covers. Yeah. 9 million store variants. Um, yeah. They're going to put dynamite thing. to shame. <laughs> yeah. yeah which is Might put themselves to, to shame. But yeah. I will say, speaking of Star Wars, right, immediately after the show tonight, we are going to have a new back issue bolo, and we're talking about five Star Wars books, right? But not any yeah. Star Wars books. Five modern Star Wars books from these return to Marvel runs that feature first appearances, some of them with a few first appearances in them, and all of them gettable. All of them you can find in back issue bins and in discount bins. And they all may have long-term potential. Um, you guys said you wanted the back issue Bolo show. We are bringing it to you. And we are we told you we're going to bring you a theme every week. And this week it is Star Wars. And I think with The Mandalorian hitting Disney Plus and receiving the reviews it has, it was time to talk about a little bit of Star Wars. Definitely. And it's important to know that it's not a end-all, be-all it's just one in a series, so you know we're going to revisit it because Star Wars has that great mythos, that great lore. So many stories, so many books, so there's sh- sure to be more Back at Shibola Star Wars. Yes, yes. There will definitely be several videos in that series. Yes. But moving on into the reader buzz, the next one we'll talk about is... Batman number 83, we've been talking lately about how we've enjoyed, especially these later issues in this run as yeah. we come to the end of Tom King's run. I enjoyed this book. I um, actually really enjoyed it because we all know, I forget what issue it was, back what five issues ago or so where, where Alfred was, was killed. Yeah, 77, I think. Yeah, so this is kind of like, um, it almost reads like um, he's dead, but Alfred is narrating the majority of the issue. And it's... yeah. Um, there's a poem involved, and while Alfred's doing the narration, Batman's trapped in a room trying to get out. Because the last issue we left, where Bane got shot right, and Batman looked like he got shot in the side or something like that. But uh, this one hits in almost like a dining room. There's like a, sitting at the table, he comes to, and basically he sees Alfred there, and that's when it hits him what's going on and then basically the whole episode or episode you say the whole issue <laughs> is alfred narrating while batman's trying to get out of this room and then all of a sudden what catwoman busts down the door and it ends with where we thought the last issue was gonna you know this issue was gonna take place where it looks like batman's getting ready to take on his dad right right yeah it's time thomas wayne versus bruce wayne i think we're gonna get that in the next issue um you know, I, Tom King's run is wrapping up very soon, so we're we're marching towards that. I also have to say, from a variant cover art perspective, there's not a million covers with Thomas Wayne on. There's not a million variant covers, but that Matina one is amazing. So, and I like it because as Bane's nowhere in this story that I could tell. Yeah, I mean in this in this issue, in this I'm issue, not say story. Yeah, like he plays into why the what's going on, but he's not in the issue yeah. actively. So yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, and I love that. But I love that Matina cover. It's dark. It's ominous, and it's everything Thomas Wayne is, right? Right. And yeah, this is the when we talked about the Italian artist before. Now this is where I like. I guess I like Matina more than Prio, I guess, but to me it plays well with the darker tone and the darker colors, but. 
either way, we're going to move into the last book on the Reader Buzz section. I'm talking about Excalibur. Now, this one had some fervor behind it on issue one. So we got issue two that finally came out. Okay, so like I didn't read this book. Yeah. And I didn't read this book because I'm still not on board with this Excalibur game. But everybody was so positive about Excalibur number one, right? I mean, that was just overwhelmingly positive. Like maybe the strongest of any X book. And yes, there were some other X books before you guys start slamming in the other comments. I know that some people liked X Force, some people liked um, some people even liked Marauders. There were other books that people liked, but Excalibur by far was the most well received. Let me know. Yeah. Issue two. Did they follow it up? Was there a Brexit? <laughs> <laughs> and, Brian, let me ask you. I get, I'm going to be a hater here, okay? I'm just going to say this right now. I'm going to say this right now. Do you really think that, like, the buzz for this is as strong as it appears to be? Or do you think this is maybe wishful thinking because there's a lot of rumor about Excalibur being how the mutants are introduced in the MCU? I think it's inflated. But at the same time, you know me, I can't, I, I can't speak too much about it because, you know, I'm not the biggest X-Men fan. I read the first issue. I was like, okay, it was, it was decent. I enjoyed the read, but it wasn't enough for me to go, wow, I'm adding this to my pool list right now. But that might also be because I'm not the biggest X-Men fan. Now, yeah. I do like X-Force, so I will keep, continue to pick that up. But, uh, yeah, well, I'm anxious to see. Let us know. If you guys are watching, let us know what you think of Excalibur number two. Yeah. That wraps up the reader buzz. We're going to move right into the fan buzz section. Starting with 2099 Alpha. This was the B cover variant, right? Right. This is the B cover uh, sold out of most large retailers. Um, this is kind of like the major kickoff book for 2099. And I, honestly, I think it just sold out because it's dope cover art. It's a unique kind of um, look. It's minimalistic, but it, you know you clearly get the message of the dual personality with Spider-Man 2099. Looks like aha music you know. video to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know exactly where you're going with that. I love another 80s reference. Um, you know, but to me, it's more like it's supposed to have that theme of like the immortal variants, where you know you see both sides of 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 the character. There was a lot of talk about this on social media. I wasn't surprised to see it start selling out. Right. When I went to the smaller Third Eye store by me, they had probably about six of these on the shelf. I don't know how many they ordered. And I got there. It was about 45 minutes after opening. It was like right before it opened at 11. I got there about 11.45. But I looked at it. I was like, eh. But let's just buy what I like. And I didn't buy yeah. this. But the next book we're going to talk about is Glow vs. the Babyface number one. This is what, the Catherine Nodet variant? Right, the Catherine Nodet variant. And, um, you know, she received a lot of attention earlier in the year for those Anita, uh, what was it, Anita Baker? Uh, no, that's the singer, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was that image Amber book. Amber Blake, Amber Blake. Yeah. I was say, I remember it was that image prestige format book. Yeah, Amber Blake, Anita Baker. Um, but yeah, so uh, she received a lot of attention for those uh, one in ten. It was close. It was well, close. It was in Samsonite. The <laughs> yeah, it was in the ballpark. She received a lot of attention for those one in ten variants. Some of them ended up selling for what over a hundred dollars upon release. Um, and you know, she also got a lot of attention because she's a model, and when people found her Instagram. There was a lot of attention on her for that, but it's good to see her continuing with IDW and doing more work. She's doing these one in ten incentives for Glow. Um, they've already solicited the art for number two. This one features Allison Brie, who's uh, Dave Franco's wife, um, and her character Ruth, or the Russian from the TV series on Netflix. Um, this is an original story kind of taking place in that universe. It's written by A.J. Mendez and Amy Garcia. A.J. Mendez is better known as A.J. Lee, the wife of CM Punk, who just returned to Fox to do the WWE backstage commentary show that has kind of like dominated wrestling Twitter over the last week. Um, but uh, Amy Garcia is also somebody of note because she's actually the CSI technician on the television show on Netflix, Lucifer. 
So she has kind of a comic book time, but it's both of their comic book writing debut. Um, and this one has received a lot of buzz from wrestling fans as well as um, kind of the uh, female reading audience seems to be interested in this one. I've seen a lot of uh, posts on social media about it. So um, this variant cover is also performing well. It's selling for like 20 to 30 dollars. Um, which doesn't surprise me because it doesn't seem like the type of book that the average comic shop was going to order a ton of copies. And it's a gorgeous cover. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think Catherine Miller at this point. It, her, it, captures, her it captures that time period for Glow perfectly, right? I mean, that whole... Right. The, the 80s, buddy. Yeah, Miami Vice. and Yeah. yeah. Then, the last book that we're going to talk about in the variant buzz. This is The Mart. This was the second print for this. Yeah, so this is one of those situations... Um, very similar to what's going on with Boom Later prints, where there's still a lot of stores that have the first prints in stock, but they're not available at distributor level. And I'm going to take a minute, rather than talk about the mark we've talked about it, but to, to just kind of talk about that aspect of the industry, Brad. Um, a lot of people kind of don't understand the way these later printings work. And, you know, certain stores load up on the first print, right? They've got they, – they, Essentially, stores become speculators. They invest heavily in a book that they believe in. And stores that are larger in larger cities, they can kind of afford to carry stock for a period of time. Because what they want to do is when issue two comes out, when issue three comes out, they want to also have issue one on their shelves. So they can afford that. But your smaller stores in places like Rock Hill, South Carolina, where I'm from, um, they don't want to carry that inventory over there. Every week, look at the size of this bolo list, and this is only a fraction yeah, it's like really pull this plus 10% usually on some of the smaller stores, right? Exactly. So, you know, the, once this book, which got announced for an option, I mean, two days after it came out, we were in Baltimore that weekend that this book came out and it had already been optioned by the weekend. So I think it was like a day or two after it came out. This book started selling out at a lot of retail stores. But again, being a heavily promoted image number one, there are stores that have a bunch of copies. So what ends up happening? Stores also reorder because as soon as they hear about this option news, they go and they put those reorders in with Diamond. So they clear Diamond out. Diamond has no copies. Now issue two is coming out. And a store is sitting there and they're like, man, everybody keeps coming in asking me about the marked, but I don't have issue one. The trade's not going to come out till after, say, issue six. How am I ever going to sell issue two and issue three and issue four if I don't have an issue one on the shelf for a new reader who comes in. So that's when these second prints end up getting produced. They get produced because Diamond is reaching out to a publisher saying, hey, we're getting a lot of demand for the mark number one. Diamond is not privy to the, your LCS's inventory. All they know is that LCS's are calling them. So that's what's happened with some of those booms releases like Once in Future and uh, Something's Killing the Children where – Everybody thinks that these publishers are playing a speculation game where they're trying to like cater to some market that makes up such a small percentage of the generalized market. Um, most of the people who are buying comic books on a weekly basis are us, the readers. They're, they just they just want a cool story. Um, but when you get buzz on a book like the Mark has, you get those like late people who are you know i didn't pick this one up when it came out but everybody keeps talking about it supposedly there's going to be a movie i need to read this and they're coming into their lcs but like you said their lcs ordered pull list plus 10 percent. that 10 percent got bought up by somebody trying to whether it's flip it or somebody who just heard that hey this is a book i need to pick up and now that's gone and they can't get them from diamond anymore so they produce these second prints this is it. This book is selling for about ten dollars, including shipping, on eBay right now, and it doesn't surprise me um, because I don't think because there's a lot of stores that have the uh, the first print still in stock. It's probably not a huge print run on this book. Um, it's, it, it was it was probably one of those books that was ordered by specific stores who again were just looking to fill this out for their reader customers. And to use it as a tool so that they can sell issues two, issues three, issue four, and issue five. And if this book sells out at Diamond, we're only on issue two of the mark. Issue two came out this week. I promise you they will produce a third print for the same exact reason. This is not a cash grab by publishers. This is publishers trying to balance out the market and honor 
all the LCSs, all their accounts, and all of the types of customers that come into a store. Uh, and again, customers come in from various pools in the market. So this isn't my opinion. This is fact. This is how this process works. Um, and I think that sometimes some of the people who are involved in like whether it's social media, in the comics industry, or and it's not industry people, but it's it's collectors and, and resellers and people like that. They think these things are just it's not the way the supply chain works. So um, I, don't, I don't mean to be preachy, but I, it's something that we've encountered a lot on the channel. Brian, you and I have gotten a lot of social media discussion about it. And we've really tried to help you guys understand the way that this works. This is a prime example. And I like that it's not boom. So you can't say that that's where this is coming from. And the fact that it is coming from every pub, every publisher, especially indie publishers, do this. And the other thing is image is creator owned. So the creators own their book. So the cost of printing falls on the creator. So they're not going to overprint books more than what the orders are. So that's why they'd rather go to either printings than to overproduce and be sitting on books. But that being said, I didn't really care for this story. But I also don't think that I'm the key demographic for it. I read it when it came out. Um, like I, I've told Jack, it kind of has like a, a sucker punch type feeling to it. If, if, if you read the, that graphic novel or saw the sucker punch movie, um, girls all living together and, and there's a leader. And then they find out that the tattoos have like powers and each one has it. It's like sucker punch meets Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> but <clears throat> it was an interesting read. It's just, wasn't my cup of tea. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that liked it and liked it and enjoyed it. Um, I picked it up just because, yeah, I like tattoos, but it didn't go the way that I thought it would went. Yeah, issue one didn't um, didn't really blow my mind. Um, I, I think most people bought it because of the option news. I think that's what happens when you get that initial option news. Yeah, yeah well, my option news is not to pick up issue number two. <laughs> but That is your option, bud. Yeah. With that, we're going to get into the long-term play, which a book I do like. Oh, I know you like this one. So bringing up Jack's long-term play this week. Man, I love this pick. And we are talking about He-Man, the Masters of the Multiverse, number one. And I know you read this book this week, so feel free to jump in and double-team and do say whatever you want to say. But Well, I'll just... I'll let you get in here in a minute, but I enjoyed this. This was a breath of fresh air because you knew there was a multiverse there before because of what happened in here, especially with there's an anti Antonia, there's a castle of wars at Hell Hell School, I forget what they called it. Um, But the story actually played out really well. I'm glad, as much as I like that Enhiak Lee cover, I'm glad the art inside for actual He Man was more. He Man ask of what you like to see him in. Um, <clears throat> we also saw like you think He Man's badass. We saw some guy that just like straight out destroyed him right from the beginning, right? And right. then then the story as the story plays out, you kind of find out why he was able to because he's basically going around and just sucking out all the power into it into the freaking sword there from all the different Castle Grey Skulls in the multiverse, right? Yeah, yeah, and this is the cool thing about this issue is. Um, it's a unique take on He-Man, which is a story like you want to talk about a, a comic that's on multiple volumes. Certainly, yeah. Masters of the Universe is on multiple volumes. And it's multiple on, publishers. <laughs> I was just about to say that, multiple publishers. So um, if you're going to write a He-Man comic, and let's also be honest, like Brian loves He-Man. I love He-Man. We're from a certain generation. But it's like when I talk about G.I. Joe, I recognize that not everybody loves it. So we're trying to – well, not we. If you're writing a comic – you're trying to see, okay, how can I appeal to an audience I've never appealed to while still staying true to the audience I've already cultivated? Yeah. And I think this comic does a really good job of it, right? They tell a story that seems interesting. If you like Spider-Verse, it gives you that kind of ve- that kind of feel. Yes. I think Spider-Verse opens the door for this, right, to be able to tell this type of story. But also I want to talk about just the specific character of yeah. anti-attorney. And, and one other thing also is right within the first issue, if you are a fan of Masters of the Universe, you get – a whole plethora of the characters you know and love just within that first issue. They might not have right. super huge parts, but they're there. 
Right, and from a kind of collector standpoint, that anti-attorney and he-man, that's why it's my long-term play. Um, I had a lot of people reach out to me. They felt like, well, why isn't Captain Marvel or, um, you know, why isn't uh, Absolute Carnage 5? Why aren't these types of books, you know, a long-term play or any number of the other first appearances? Well, I'll tell you. Now, first off, I want to say go to simplemenscomics.com. Check out the Bolo article. Um, I kind of give a shortened version of what we talk about here on the show every week as part of kind of our rebranded Bolo list. Um, but what I talked about in that article is what I want to talk to you guys about here is the fact that like He-Man is a property on the rise. It's a property on the rise. And if you don't believe me, you just kind of got to look, look at what's going on. They, they're rebooting the toy line. Yeah, just ask Kevin Smith. <laughs> yeah, they're rebooting the toy line. Kevin Smith has an anime movie coming to Netflix, which he teases to involve yeah. some major names. And within uh, that toy line, you got the like the WWE crossover type toy that's going on. Yes, and WWE already announced a second series ahead of the release of the first series. Yeah, what are they when calling it? Like Wrestlers of I forget what the actual Wrestlers of the Universe or Yeah, it's, I think it's Wrestlers of the Multiverse yeah. or something like that. Um, so whenever you see and this is this is to give you a little um, shout out to toyinformer.com. This is to give you a little toy informer information whenever you see a toy line before its first wave comes out solicit a second wave like that that tells you that retailers bought up that first wave and there's history with these wwe crossovers they did it they've done a ghostbusters crossover that did two sellout waves um they did a ninja turtles crossover that did two sellout waves garbage pail kids i don't know about toys but they just did that crossover with that yeah, so I'm I'm not I'm not at all shocked to see that this is doing well. There's even a Castle Grayskull inspired wrestling ring, um, WWE ring. That's a completely new mold. So they've gone all in on that. Um, yeah, and I think like the I, ring comes with two figures, right? Like the Triple H and John Cena one. The yeah, the Triple H and John Cena. John has kind of got the uh, of the He Man kind of get up to him. Yeah, um, Triple H's got like claw sword hands. Yeah. So, you know, they, they, they've got a whole line planned, um, like I said, multiple waves of action figure. And, and we talk about follow the money, right? So these are major properties. Um, you're talking about Mattel, and you're talking about WWE investing money into the Masters of the Universe brand, feeling like that brand can help them. Again, they're rebooting the toy line. You're going to see new uh, Masters of the Universe figures hitting stores. Um you're also looking at, like we said, the Kevin Smith. And, again, the continued rumors that Hollywood is trying just to figure out how do we do, right? They're looking for a story is what we hear is the thing holding up a Masters of the Universe movie. They're looking for that story that they could tell and working it with a budget. But it, it's coming eventually, right? Like There are certain properties you just know you're going to get a movie, and Masters of the Universe is one of them. Um, He-Man is an iconic character. Skeletor is an iconic character. And they're going to show up in a movie at some point. Um, so for all of those reasons, He-Man has kind of got some momentum behind it. But what makes this even cooler is, to me, Brian, before we went on air, I compared this first appearance to two characters. Lord Draken in the Power Rangers. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Batman who laughs in DC Comics. Because it is a spin on an existing character. But this isn't new, right? You know, right. this character has been around since 1985. So this is a character that has existed to hardcore He-Man fans like Brian. Yeah, like Lawrence started in what, a 1985 German audio book? <laughs> yeah, Or yeah, book on right. tape or whatever? Right, a German exclusive uh, book on tape. Um, and, you know, you're talking about essentially a dark version of He-Man. Um, he's got kind of like an all black look. Um, I, I, I'm not surprised they gave him a little bit of an update in the comic. So he didn't look quite so like almost blackface he man. Um, but uh, this character, you know, is kind of like the opposite, right? Of he man, similar to the way the Batman who laughs kind of is that opposite of Batman. It's mixed with the Joker. Um, similar to the way Lord Draken is kind of that opposite of Tommy, the green Ranger. Um, but they still encompass so much of what that initial character has. Uh, if you go back and you get bring in toys, look at toys because that's where He Man really is its strongest. And I know Brian, you've got that action figure right with you. The chase figure from what was it, 2016? Yeah. 
that is one of the hottest modern, if not the hottest modern, um, He-Man action figure on the market. He-Man fans went crazy for that figure upon release. It was released with a retail price of like twenty nine ninety nine. Yeah, I think I paid. I pre-ordered it from GameStop because they had it on their site and it was like thirty four bucks. But I'm not sure what the actual. And I think they were upcharging because it was the chase. Yeah. I think the I think the original retail was like nineteen ninety nine on the figure uh, or something like that. But, yeah. um, but now it regularly trades for a hundred bucks. And there was a time when it traded for more, when it was trading for like one hundred and fifty. That's how popular this character is. Incredibly cult popular. It's popular because of its history. Think about like those Spider Man issues that originated in Mexico. This is kind of that feel. This is a character that kind of debuted in this like weird action figure time there's actually a re-release figure from germany on the original um masters of the universe card stock yeah, that sells and it has like, the the tape <laughs> cassette has the tape. tape sells for like 250 yeah. bucks um and there's a tough find and the so super is, seven reaction figure yeah which those are ch- cheaper figures right they, they didn't really pop as much on the secondary market but even that figure goes for like 35 bucks yeah. it's like three yeah. times it's Original asking price. Yeah, they're usually, I think, listed on Super 7's site for like 18 I think, is what most of them average at. Mm-hmm. So you're like, okay, so like twice the yeah. initial um, asking price. So this is a character that has a proven track record dating back to 1985 that it's popular. But for whatever reason, and I don't really know the reason, has never been featured in a comic book. Um, I know some of our most um, kind of Fervorous comic book collectors uh, like Topher of True First um, have gone back and tried to find the, if there was an appearance, haven't found one. I, I will say if like- it does exist, Germany also had this Master of the Universe magazine type comic called Ihapa. Mm-hmm. I think if it exists, it'd probably be in one of those issues. And those are cool because they also have. Um, these splash page landscapes in the middle of them by like the Spanish artist. I forget his name, but talk about freaking gorgeous. But I think if there was one to exist, it'd be probably in that book. But I haven't right. seen it. Right. So so even if it did exist, we haven't seen it in the U.S. Um, this is the first appearance in like you know our comics, but it's probably the first ever um, of a character. Like I said, a character that has a proven track record. How rare is that? You don't see that and. Looking at all of this media, there's no reason to believe that Kevin Smith won't use anti-attorney a He-Man, or if he doesn't, that the movie couldn't use it, or if the movie doesn't use it and it does well in a sequel. Yeah. There's a lot of reason. And then you also get, just like anti-attorney a He-Man is another universe's He-Man that's opposite. We get a Skeletor character who's op- the opposite, who's like a good guy. <laughs> yeah, it's like Smurf uh, he's, Skeletor, yeah, he's but he's grown. <laughs> right. But that's another thing where that be brought into. So when I read this issue, when I look at this issue, when I look at all of the facts surrounding this property, I sit and go, you know, the point of the long-term play is a book you can buy now for cover price while – all, everyone else is chasing other books that are spiking. You can buy this book for cover price easy. You might get laughed at on release day, but you stick them in the long box, and at some point, when everybody else is paying 25 30 45 bucks, you've got them already. Um, and this book, to me, has that written all over it. Uh, it's going to take some time for Masters of the Universe to kind of fully get its comeback moment, but I think it's coming. And I think that, um, you know, we've seen... Masters of the Universe books pop on the secondary market before. We've seen the one-shots do well. We've seen some of the image books do well. Some of the variants, um, the Dave Wilkins variant, we've seen some of these books do well. So there's already been proven that while the Masters of the Universe fan base is smaller, it's like G.I. Joe, it's it's like Ninja Turtles, maybe smaller, but it's like... um, you know, some of those types of properties where Transformers, where when they want something, they're going to buy it and they're going to keep it. So it's not going to go back onto the market and that can drive prices up. So this is also not an issue where I, I, Brian, I don't see LCS as being like, let me get a hundred He-Man books. So I don't think that the print run of this is going to be huge. So looking at everything that went on this week and 
Captain Marvel, a book that I think is a little going to be a little bit overprinted, and Absolute Carnage, I think is going to be a little bit overprinted. Um, I think this is less of a crapshoot than any other first appearance. <clears throat> I think there's more of a reason to believe, and there's already customer awareness of the characters appearing. Um, so I really like this one. I, this is my long-term play, and I feel good about it. Yeah, I like this also because the last two Masters of the Universe series we got have been crossover between Thundercats and then Injustice. Yeah. So here's one we got back straight in Masters of the Universe or Multiverse in this case. But either way, we just sit here. Great long-term play because you know I can sit here and talk to you all night about Masters of the Universe. But we're going to wrap it up right there. And like we said, make sure you guys check out right on the channel right now. We have that back issue bolo where we're talking about those five Star Wars figures. In fact, if you look right over here right now, over here on the right, you're going to see a little card show up. You can just click that and watch it. But this is Jack and Brian with the Bolo Show every Thursday night, 9 p.m. And we will see you next week.